It's the 13th day of August, and this day is important because today, this day, those of you on The View from a Pew will learn the facts, the truth, from a journalist with integrity. Craig Robinson on the Kent Sorensen Issue, today live with Tom Coates. Welcome to The View from a Pew, a conversation among Christians who are out to grow their faith by asking the simple questions, the tough questions, and the stuff you really wish your pastor would talk about. Come on now, let's reason together. It's your voice we want to hear. The phone lines are open, so join the conversation. Call 855-244-0077. That's 855-244-0077. Now, here's your host. J. Michael McCoy. 13th day of August in the Lord's year 2013. I'm J. Michael McCoy, and this is the Tuesday edition of The View from a Pew, live, <clears throat> excuse me, live on 98.3 or 99.3 KTIA, uh, powered by Webcast One Live. If you're listening to this on a podcast, uh, welcome. Hey, you're a, an, an internet guy. Have you ever heard of, hold on, I'm going to tell you right here. You think I'm going to be slow, but I'm not. S T I T C H E R Stitcher.com? No. Well, apparently, 70% of all podcasts that are listened to today come from this site. Huh. And they contacted us and want us to be one of their contributing people with shows. And I thought, well, sure, they just want, you know, mm-hmm. some of my gold. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> McDuff. And uh, no, apparently, we produce enough unbiased, well, as the guy on the phone put it, your shows are either typically biased, but everybody says they are, or you have shows that try to be in the middle. And he said, you're not selling, nobody's selling anything on our platform. Nobody comes in here and tries to sell their widgets or their new purses. So they're going to give it to us for nothing. That's awesome. And they have like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that automatically go there and uh, watch, listen to some of their podcasts. Mm, that's so, great. Yeah. Every once in a while. I'm just so surprised because, you know, this platform started five years ago. It's just a place for me to do Max World with Tom, mm-hmm. uh, you know, an hour every day, or I guess we started out two hours every day, five yeah. days a week. Yeah. And now here we are five years later, and we got almost a billion, almost a billion podcasts listened to or watched wow. by over 200,000 people in the second quarter. That's crazy. Yeah. That's awesome. No, no, no. Not a billion. A million. 900 and some odd thousand. Excuse mm-hmm. me, not a billion, but still. It's a lot. Yeah, that is. Okay. Um, here's why today's show is important to those of you listening. Because in this world of Facebook bloggers and website uh, uh, exaggerators and media that we used to depend on that had really important acronyms like NBC and ABC and CBS... We can't trust them anymore. Uh, I don't know about you, but I have a very, very limited number of sites that I can go to that I can trust. And some of them are liberal. Don't get me wrong. I'm not just saying I only agree with the guys who agree with me. There's also some incredible liberal sites that I go to that if this guy writes this or this young lady writes this, uh, it's true. I don't have to agree and I don't have to believe, but I know and I have to admit that it's true. I think the Iowa Republican is one of those. And uh, Craig is in the house. Craig Robinson is in the house today with us to talk about, um, um, I don't know, am I getting overboard here, but aren't you kind of the Woodward and Bernstein <laughs> of, of, of this scandal? Though? Well, that, that's that's taken it maybe a little far, but um, in terms of, of, of Kent Sorensen's dealing with the Bachman and the yeah. Ron Paul campaign, I mean, I don't think you could find any other place with better coverage and more uh you know, kind of the go-to place for those stories than the Iowa Republican. Well, and you had no vendetta. You're not elected official trying to get reelected no, or no, formally no. elected. I mean, you're you're just this is your deal. Like Look, you and me and Tom, this is our passion to talk about this. A- absolutely, and and it's newsworthy stuff. It's it's material that I think people um, they have known that there's something going on here, and they've wanted to get to the bottom of it. But there's been it's been difficult to find evidence to support what people have suspected for a long time. 
Uh, and, and we've been able to provide that. We've been able to help walk people through the Senate ethics process and, and a lot of things. So uh, when it comes to, I mean, those, I, I was talking to a national reporter today just about the website in general. And and really, those those two Sorensen um, scandals that have happened this year are really, I mean, some of what I would have to say are our best work in terms of uh, providing uh, real journalistic content. Yeah. Uh, to, and to I would website. agree. Congratulations. Thanks. Uh, there just aren't a lot of people that are willing to. I mean, you did what the old reporters did. You did what I was taught in journalism school back in the 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. Do not print until you have a reliable source. Right. And we got away from that somewhere in the 70s or 80s, and we got to unconfirmed source. Right. Which was an acceptable thing, which I well, don't and, I, and then the one part of this whole uh, saga that speaks to that, that hasn't really been reported is, is that I actually had phone conversations myself with Kent Sorensen uh, in the fall of, of 2011 uh, as he was um, kind of wavering in support with Michelle Bachman. He, ta- he called and talked to me about wanting to move to the Ron, Ron Paul campaign. He indicated pretty directly that the reason he was thinking about moving was to, you know, it was better for his family. It was going to help his colleagues in, in the Iowa Senate, all of these things. So I had, I mean, my source isn't just Dennis Fasaro who gave me emails and audio recordings. I also had Kent Sor- I had a relationship with Kent Sorensen, but I never, I could never write about it because it was just, I didn't have any proof besides what he was telling me. And, and while I thought that was very credible and that there was other people when he, when he jumped ship that came forward that said, Hey, I had similar conversations with Kent Sorensen. Well, I don't have any way to document a phone conversation that I had with a guy a month or two ago. Uh, but when, when Mr. Fasaro came forward and provided me emails, audio of phone calls uh, and Kent in his own voice, uh, I felt like I had plenty of, of, of evidence to move forward with the story. So uh, Mr. Fasaro is your quote, deep throat in this uh, well, Watergate saga. A little bit different though, that, I mean, he actually really helped me in terms of, of being able to write the story because he was willing to step forward to give his name, to take the criticism of coming forward. He's not, he's not some guy in a in a dark um, parking ramp gotcha. um, that I couldn't talk about. Well, you so. could you couldn't mention his name. Were you a deep Were you a deep throat? Uh, the question I think a lot of people would ask right off the bat is, what is his motivation? What's sure. Dennis's motivation? Look, now, Dennis is someone who is um, you know had been I would say in the inner circle with uh, with Kent and his friends. He was uh, in the Rat Pack. Yeah, for a long time. I mean, and this is a guy that he he lives in Virginia. He's worked in politics, but he's also worked in this state for a number of years on the right to work issue. Uh, when Chet, basically the entire uh, four years that Chet Culver was governor, Dennis Fasaro was in this state helping uh, protect Iowa's right to work status. And he became quick friends with, with Kent, uh, with the doors, everyone who's kind of involved in the scandal. And so... Uh, I also viewed him how as deep does credible. It go? I know the doors and Kent Sorensen. How how deep? How many people involved in this? No, I think that what we disclosed on the website is really uh, probably as deep as it goes. But I mean, where it's crazy is not the Iowa side of it. It goes straight to the top of Ron Paul's Ron presidential Paul's. campaign, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. includes his campaign chairman, his campaign. Uh, um, manager and his deputy campaign manager, uh, which is to me shocking. That's the part of the story that I find amazing that they were not negotiating. It wasn't Iowans and Iowans, you know, from one camp to another camp trying to negotiate a deal. This is, this is Sorensen's group of people, his confidants negotiating with the highest ranks of the Ron Paul campaign. And Michelle Bachman, apparently Michelle Bachman and her campaign were paying him as well. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's another thing too, that, um, actually, he's been decently um, uh, documented by Andy Parrish, her her first campaign manager of that presidential campaign. And Parrish released emails and an affidavit that showed, that talked about what Kent needed to get paid. Uh, it was $7,500 a month and who it was coming from. For how many months? It, it, well, throughout the campaign. So, um Look, I mean, the, there is a mountain of evidence here. And, uh, and some of these, um, you know, some of our media sites like the Des Moines Register, I think don't quite understand this or cannot devote enough brain power to look at the mountain of evidence and say, I don't know how some guy could stand there and, and deny and say, well, this is fabricated or this is made up 
or this isn't really what went on. I did nothing wrong because I, the evidence, in my uh, opinion, speaks for itself. Uh, Craig Robinson here with the Iowa Republican. What's the link when I get to the Iowa Republican? Is it the, uh, in his own words, Sorensen confers payment? That is the audio tape. Um, that is the, the story that has the transcript of the audio tape okay. and the audio tape of, right. of, uh, of him in his own words on a phone call of Fasaro. And All I right. assume you also have the emails on your site. The well. emails are a different article okay. um, uh, the day before uh, that okay. was published. How did, um, in my business, if I call you and I'm going to record you, I have to let you know up front that I'm recording this phone call or I commit an FCC violation. Did Fasaro uh, not need to tell Kent he was t taping the conversation? No, there's, uh, there's 38 states uh, in this country where only one Mm -hmm. One party to the call has to consent for it to be recorded. In this case, that was Fasaro. And, and this is something I talked to, to him about before we publish. Um, the laws in Virginia and Iowa and Kentucky, where all these calls took place that we had recordings of, uh, all have the same state law, which he could consent to recording himself. All right. Why, why did Fasaro want to whistle blow on Sorensen? Look, um, again, I had I had had conversations with Fasaro for months. I mean, we're talking, um, and it wasn't regular, but I mean, I mean, about once a month, I get a phone call from this guy, and he would talk to me about the situation. He wanted to know where it all stood with Sorensen and Bachman, and I, I'll be honest, maybe I was a little naive. I didn't know where this was going. Uh, Dennis is not someone that I would consider in my group of friends. He's just someone that I knew and dealt with. Um, and so I really, and he always kind of implied that he had a lot of material that could prove this, uh, but he never really wanted to give it over. And, and frankly, I didn't really push for it. Um, and so um, a week ago now, or almost a week and a half ago now, um, he had kind of had enough after, he, he had been working the angle with Jesse Benton, who was Ron Paul's top guy, saying, look, there's a lot of garbage that went down that's illegal and corrupt. You need to step forward. You need to take responsibility and you need to come clean. And Jesse Benton said, you're crazy. You're delusional. You're making it all up. And, now, and who's this Benton? Jesse Benton was Ron Paul's national campaign chairman for his 2012 campaign. He ran his congressional reelections. He ran Rand Paul's reelection campaign. He is married to Ron Paul's granddaughter. All right. And all the time, Jesse Benton knew that absolutely the, 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 the wrong had been done. Absolutely. Okay. In fact, the, the audio tape uh, has Kent uh, emphatically saying that Jesse Benton knew uh, about this deal. And, and you got to remember that audio clip is from a phone call from between December 28th and January 3rd of 2012, meaning it hap that that phone call is right in that time span where Sorensen had just jumped ship to Paul and right before the caucuses. And, and okay, to do that, even without money, is unethical? Yeah, I, l l let me be the first to say, Ken Sorensen, probably uh, maybe a week or two or maybe even three weeks before he actually jumped ships uh, to, to the Paul campaign, had called me and, and talked to me about um, I think I'm going to, you know, he wanted my advice as to what, how he should do it. And I told him, don't do it. I said, Kent, there is, there is no bad deeds. Uh, there's, there's no, there's nothing bad going to happen to you for going down with the ship by staying loyal, uh, to your candidate. No one's going to think less of you. I, I go, but man, if you jump ship, yeah. it's going to look bad and that's going to haunt you for the rest of your life. And then that's when he would say, well, you know, I really need to do this because I got to look out for my family and I got to I got to look out for my colleagues and all this stuff. So he was in, saying he implying, was doing, was he saying he was doing it for money in essence then Craig? In essence, implying that there was there was a financial motivation for him to do this, that he needed to take care of his family. I mean, what, a, what does he do for a living now? I saw him in front of a real estate sign uh, some months back. Is he trying to peddle real estate or what uh, he's doing? I think he does a, a number of things. I think that, you know, he's also, uh, he classifies himself as a consultant. 
Okay, we're going to take our first break. Uh, If this is confusing to you, you're not alone. I'm trying to catch up and keep up with the conversation. But feel free to call in and ask your questions at 244-0077. Craig Robinson in the house with Tom Coates on KTIA, Iowa. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. I brought a long couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. (laughs) Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. Just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're gonna do? (laughs) There is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you gonna say that to a client? No. You don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're gonna be listening. They're gonna wanna know what your challenges are. Then they're gonna come and give you options and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family. You know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed today. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me but is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. (laughs) Keep going though. I like this. (laughs) Just give us a try. I'm gonna take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed right or it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. We've got questions. You've got the answer. Join the conversation. It's your voice we want to hear. So call 855-244-0077. Now, here's J. Michael McCoy. 21 minutes after the hour on the 13th of August in the Lord's year 2013. Thank you and welcome uh, to The View from a Pew on Saturday or uh, Saturday here on Tuesday afternoon. And uh, if you want to meet that super comic book celebrity superstar, Tom Coates, (laughs) you are out at the consumer credit booth in the Varied Industries building, air conditioned, I might add, the whole fair. Well, I'm not there every minute of the day, but I was out there for quite a few hours today shaking hands and uh, kissing babies and doing what I could. And what I heard is that anybody that comes up to you and mentions my name, Mac's name, you'll buy him a bucket of cookies. That's right. (laughs) That's right. That's a safe bet. (laughs) At least a cookie or two. (laughs) All right. Um, Craig Robinson is here on the show with us today. And Craig is, uh, um, um, well, you're a man of integrity. Uh, You just are. Uh, there's just some things that uh, uh, you don't print until you know, and you don't say it out loud until you've double checked, and you're mm-hmm. one of those guys. And for whatever reason, the good Lord blessed him with the meat, the facts, the bones on the whole Kent Sorensen case. Uh, as you kind of said in the first portion, you, you didn't really pursue a lot of it. It just kind of came to you. Right. I mean, it kind of fell in my lap. And, um, you know, like I said, I mean, Dennis Fasaro is someone who's called me 
periodically uh, throughout the year. And I mean, I, this was always something that I suspected. This is always something that I was aware of and was looking for. And in fact, when the Bachman thing started to unravel, I always thought, well, why, why doesn't the media question the Paul angle of this? If someone needed, you know, if someone needed to be compensated, you know, for this work, you'd think someone would need to be compensated there. But I, I mean, I didn't, I mean, I didn't badger Dennis Fasaro because I thought he had the goods. He voluntarily, you know, I'm honestly, he ruined a weekend of mine because I, he just dumped all this stuff on there and I started reading and sorting it out. And then, and then I had to play the game with him of, well, would he, I, I mean, I had to twist an arm to get audio. And I said, look, the, the, this case, this article is, is legit, but I feel like I have to come out with audio. That's why the first day was just emails. I, I told him throughout that. I said, look, we can't, we're not, there's nothing in here that says Sorensen actually knew or actually took something without audio, the audio that you're telling me. And then he sent me the tapes and that's the, why the next day we came out with it. And that, and in those tapes, Sorensen himself, himself, in his own words, he doesn't. And and the other thing is if you listen to these videos or these, well, they're YouTube videos but of the audio. If you listen to the audio, he is not in these phone calls with, with Fasaro. He is not asked a question like, did you receive a check? He volunteers, to, uh, you know, volunteers all the information about this. I mean, he, he describes the setting. He describes everything about knowing, it. Volunteering this information. Knowing that it's wrong. No, no doubt. No in doubt. In any ethics. I have no doubt. Wrong. Okay. Is, it's, we, we know it's wrong in the ethics camp in the, as a senator, mm -hmm. right? As a state senator or yeah. a legislator, whatever you call him. Um, is there criminal? Yes, this is this is where this is where I don't understand uh, Senator Sorensen's actions, current actions. All the criminal problems that uh, evolve from all of this, they impact Jesse Benton, Dimitri uh, Kassiri, and and John Tate, the Ron Paul uh, people, and the campaign. It's bad news for them. It's bad, Paul. Uh, it's bad news for Ron Paul 2012 because I think, as we've seen in the Bachman case, it could be an FBI case, it could be an FBC uh, case, it could be an IRS case. Sorensen's only uh, the only thing that he's really on the hook for is the Senate ethics thing. Because I, I mean, in my, I'm not a lawyer, but when I look at this, he's in trouble with the Iowa Senate ethics. But I don't think there's any Iowa laws that he would have violated. Okay, but, so the, other, but the other guys are under under the possibility of prosecution from a criminal standpoint? Absolutely. And if I was Kent Sorensen, I would want to move on and say, look, here's my dealings with ind these individuals. This is what I did. Um, I'll, I'll cooperate with any questions you have for me. I'm moving on. But to do that, you have to say, I'm willing to take any punishment that the Senate Ethics Committee deals out. Would, would, would this be of a magnitude that they would force his uh, force his resignation from the Iowa Senate? It go, the, it can get to that, and and in fact, I I look, I haven't written about this, but I actually think the worst thing here is not uh, the big issue is not did Kent Sorensen get paid or not, and I know that's the focus with the Des Moines Register. That's the focus with a lot of people. Did he actually get paid? Well, he took a check, but did he cash it? That doesn't matter anymore to me. My issue with Kent Sorensen today, and I think the problem it should be for most Iowans is, is how many lies have you told to the national media, to the state media, to the Senate Ethics Committee, and to Iowans? Because at some point, you, you need to tell the truth. And I think he just keeps digging a hole. And I think he should stop digging and just explain to us what actually took place and what, what happened. And who was involved? I'm going to just say something off cuff here a minute. Uh, it's no secret that I'm a recovering alcoholic, mm -hmm. uh, almost four years. And when you describe to me weaving those lies, my stomach guts up. Because I can remember the days when I would tell a lie. Yep. Because that's what the guy wanted to hear. And it was easier for mm -hmm. me. And then somebody else came out. Oh, I heard about that. Is that true? Well, I got to lie again. Mm -hmm. And while you were saying that, I just got this gut-wrenching, because I know what that feels like to just lie and lie and lie until the point where you don't even know what the truth is anymore. I mean, I looked at, so, I, I mean, I, I had a phone call last Monday with Kent Sorensen before I published. And I said, 
I'm publishing an article. This is what it says. I want comment. And he told me it was completely fabricated. Dennis Fasaro's crazy, insane person. Uh, he was fired from right to work and he's trying to get vengeance. And I said, and then I asked him, I drilled down. And I asked him about, was your wife given a check from the Ron Paul, from Ron Paul's deputy campaign manager um, and, and from a jewelry store? I gave him details to know. I, I have a lot of details here. Again, deny, deny, deny. The next day, his attorney is in the Minnesota Star Tribune saying he has never directly or indirectly taken any money from the Ron Paul campaign. Well, that's the day we published the audio. Well, then it's pretty clear that there's been a check. There was a meeting. There was a check. We don't know what he did with the check, but there was a check, and it really looks bad. And it is. It's this tangling of, oh. of lies. Oh. It's bad. Well, now, now tell me if I heard this correctly, because I've tried to just follow you on this. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I listened to you on Jan. I think you even told me he was on Jan. Simon, yeah, to Simon, 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 you did a great job. But someplace along the line, I heard that, Kent and his wife and some people were at a dinner and Kent went up to go to the bathroom. And during that time, his wife got the check. Yes. So he could honestly say he didn't see her get a check. I think this is what some people do is that, um, look, I've never been paid by the Bachman. You have to look at the words. I, I right. just re- I pulled his affidavit for the um, Senate Ethics Committee. It says, you know, I have never been directly or indirectly paid by the Bachman campaign or Michelle Pack. True. Well, but were you paid by CNM Industries, who was a consultant for the campaign? Well, and why isn't that indirectly? Well, it should be indirectly. And yeah. that's where I think he gets in, in trouble because he was out there denying any direct or indirect, but then he has a check in his po- back pocket. And it's from a, hey, it's from a jewelry store. So, of course, that's not have any association, except it's from the wife of Ron Paul's deputy campaign manager's jewelry store. Okay, Craig, so I'm a... Which is a crime. I'm a... What? Are, you, are, are we, we talk, are we talking that's about a, a cri- ser- I mean, that's, are, are we talking about a, a mi- I mean, crime is it a misdemeanor? Is it a felony? How, how heavy a fall are we look, talking about? If, if someone is, I mean, look, if I have a if, Tom, if you have a business and you're, you know, there's a political campaign and your wife's working for it, and she comes to you and says, "Hey, could uh, could you write a check out of consumer credit to Tom Coates because he's going to endorse if we can get him some money?" That's a bribe. I mean, that's and, and it, it's there's. It's unethical and it's it's unlawful. And it's, I think it's unlawful for the Paul campaign to operate that way more than anything. Mm-hmm. Is this going to come down on Rand? Yeah, I think this really does uh, impact him because these are the people. You gotta, in politics, everyone has a tribe. And I've tried to describe this throughout the years. Everyone has a tribe. Right. And the tribe now is is... You know, they're off helping, you know, they're with the Campaign for Liberty or they're helping Mitch McConnell, but they all know they're all going to end up at the same place. And in 2016, that's with Rand Paul. And so this does hurt uh, Rand. All right. Long-term. So if I'm a frothing at the mouth liberal uh, 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 <clears throat> mouthpiece, Sue Dvorsky. Okay. <laughs> and I'm listening to this broadcast today. How do you explain to the liberals that we don't eat our own, that what we do is we let truth rise to the top? And unlike the liberals, and I, you can kick my butt for saying this, any liberal out there, when your guy gets in trouble, you go put your head in the sand. And right. You, and circle the wagons and defend them. Yeah. The, the, when our guy gets in trouble, it is what it is because we have an American policy and in, in integrity to follow. Yeah. I mean, look, I... It, it hurts me when I like tune in and, and I know that uh, Rachel Maddow, she did three segments on this on her national show. And most of them all ended with focusing on how bad this was for Iowa's first in the nation status. This is not good for Iowa's uh, caucus status. And it pains me that it creates that problem. But what would be even worse is if we didn't root out this stuff ourselves. If we turned a blind eye and said, you know, hey, I know all this went on again. Hopefully it won't happen again. Um, Look, that's even worse because then we're asking for it 
to happen again, but, and it's probably ten times worse. But that's what our competition does. I know that's I, yes. I, well, and I it's mean, worse than that. Sometimes, Mac, when we have very little evidence to go on or a very minor infraction that the left is blowing up, we'll, we'll kick them out just because they're they're you know they're it, it's painful to have them in our midst. So even if they're not that guilty, I mean, we're, we're just totally opposite what the Democrats but, are. But look, I, I was on I was on uh, WHO TV with Sue Dvorsky over the weekend. Mm-hmm. And and she's outraged over this, and I think rightfully so. I, mm-hmm. I mean, I agree with pretty much her point of Who view is on this. She? I'm sorry. She's a former chairperson of the Iowa Democratic. Party. Okay, all right. Very outspoken. Okay. Um, but so she's outraged over this, mm-hmm. and and look, we were focused on this scandal, but in the back of my head was, well, Sue, where were you when we were talking about all the stuff that was, um, that mm-hmm. was in you know corrupt and wrong in, in terms of the payments that that. Senator Harkin was accepting for the Harkin Institute at Iowa State. (laughs) I mean, it's that's pay to play too. Same scandal involving, and in fact, I think it played maybe a minor role of him saying, "Look, I'm not going to run for re-election." But where were you there? I mean, the thing is, is I, and what's her answer? She, well, I wish I, I should have asked her that, but I mean, we're oh, okay. I, yeah. I, I didn't. But she she would have had some distinction and and saying, well, that's as far different, you know, and, and right and, and some but, rationalization. But but my point is, is that the one thing I can point back to anyone who might be disappointed at me for you know blowing a whistle on her. I'm own, not, by the way. Look, I'm, well, and I'm I don't care what people think of me. Uh, but the the thing is, is I've been consistent through this. You know, right after the caucuses, when Matt Strawn wouldn't declare Santorum the winner, after the recount mm-hmm. declared him the winner, mm-hmm. um, yeah, we went both barrels at him and said, this is wrong, this is corrupt, this hurts Iowa's First in the Nation caucus. This is the same mindset I have today. This time, instead of being an establishment guy like Matt Strawn is, this is a conservative activist who I think has acted, you know, equally bad. And, and it hurts the caucuses maybe more so because this is now like a year long. Well, are we talking about the caucus? There were two. There were two items that came up. I thought at this point when Kent Sorensen jumped and I assumed and I figured most people that were looking at assumed it was for money. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing was was when the uh, governor of Texas blew the whistle on Bob Vanderplatz, said that a uh, million dollars for uh, my endorsement. Um you know, but that you, I thought. Dirty but if you want, do you want to know where that came from? Yes, His, I do. But st- hold it. Sure. Because I'm up against a hard break. And I also want to dig further into why this could be bad for the Iowa caucuses. <clears throat> We're coming back. Tom Coates in the house. My special guest, Craig Robinson. It's The View from a Pew. This afternoon live on webcast1live.com. KTIA, Iowa. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. toward another heart attack. A woman who struggles daily with diabetes and her memory. A boy whose headaches keep him out of school. A mother who one morning discovers a lump. A girl whose condition defies diagnosis. You come to us because you need answers, but you also need more. You need understanding of what you're going through. You need comfort. You need to be treated as an individual, not a condition. You need to be included in your own care. You are the point of everything we do. That's why we're changing to Unity Point Health. It's a model of care that will help us work better together, where the physician who knows you best takes the lead, coordinating your care through every step, from the hospital to specialists, to rehabilitation, to health services in the home and in the community, to making sure the treatments are effective, By working as a team, we surround you with care, helping you manage your health and your conditions, guiding you to making better choices and living a healthier life. The point of unity is you. Unity Point Health. This is Dan Fry, host of A Rebel's Cause Radio, and I'm here to ask you a question. Are you tired of being marketed a second-rate product at a first-rate price? Or perhaps more importantly, do you want to wear something that shows who you are, which is a Christian, but doesn't look silly or even worse, just theologically incorrect? I want to introduce you to Wrath and Grace Clothing. They're a company that wants to provide you with clothes that you actually like, prices you can afford, and most importantly, 
They offer a sound, biblical message that represents who you are as a Christian. From the message presented in the graphics to the fit and finish, they have made their company on first-rate designs and high-quality fabrics and inks and offered at a price you can afford. Wrath and Grace Clothing, their mission is to proclaim the wrath and the grace of a sovereign God one shirt at a time. Go to wrathandgrace.com to check out all their designs. That's wrathandgrace.com. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. We're the ones in the pew, not pulpit. Come on now, let's reason together. The phone lines are open, so call 855-244-0077. Now, here's J. Michael McCoy. Okay, 22 before the top on the 13th day of August. This is uh, a real important show, and uh, if you're just joining us, it just doesn't get much more honest than this. I I want you to think about the week after Watergate. And Tom Coates and Mac McCoy sit down with Woodward, Woodward and Bernstein. Now, I don't know if you know much about Woodward and Bernstein. If you're young, you may have never heard of them. But they are the reporters that uncovered Watergate. And they did it with such integrity that here we are 40 years later, 50 years later, mm-hmm. and no one's ever questioned whether what they brought to the surface was the truth or not. Any other Washington scandal, hell, they're still wondering who killed JFK. Right. But Woodward and Bernstein did the job to where really prosecution, defense, judges, all those concerns said, okay, these are the facts. What are we going to do with them? What's our responsibility as the Senate Ethics Committee, as a a candidate considering running again, as Mr. Sorensen may be, uh, as uh, the Dorr family, who is obviously deeply involved in this and has a lot to lose, Uh, Dennis Fasaro and Jesse Benton. I mean, they've got national reputations that could be destroyed. Uh, If your national reputation gets destroyed on the liberal side, it's a, a badge of honor. If it gets destroyed on the Republican side, you might as well... You know, be a pedophile of small children. And it's not fair. It's just the way mm-hmm. it's the way the accuser works in this world. I don't want to get all Jesus-y on you, but the accuser is for the Democrats. And if I was Pat Robertson, that'd be front page line tomorrow. <laughs> but it's true. Liberals and Democrats side with the accuser. Conservatives usually are siding with Jesus. And it's a tough battle when the accuser who uses his methods of lying, cheating, and stealing hypocrisy to the max and pointing fingers, it, it's tough to rise above the cream, especially at this point in America. But on a, on a, on a do we call it a scandal? I, I do. I mean, that's... Okay. I think it's Is it the Kent Sorensen scandal? Well, we can't just leave it hanging. I, I did I'd introduce the other black guy that we suffered in the, in the caucuses with Bob Vanderplatz, and we got interrupted because of the break. We need to, we need to wrap that up. All right, with, you uh, go ahead, and then we'll move on. All right, now, just to rephrase, I said the other black eye was when uh, Rick Perry said that uh, he had been asked for a shakedown by Bob Vanderplatz for a million dollars for his endorsement. It came late in the campaign, and Bob didn't deny asking for money, but he said he wanted it so that he could uh, um, uh, advertise the endorsement and and if it had been much earlier in the campaign where there was more airtime and more time, period, uh, that might have held more water for me. But I was embarrassed with that and the Kent Sorensen say, you say to that, Craig. Well, uh, when, what, I watched that in terms of the Vanderplatz endorsement uh, whole saga. I mean, it was crazy. Um, and far too much attention was given to it, to be honest with you. But the first person in that scenario who said that Vanderplatz was shaking people down for money, the first quotable person that I ever saw was Kent Sorensen. I saw that. And it's That's crazy. It's, it's nuts to me that, but it's always, we always want, you know, look at our society. We always want to indict the person who's doing the same thing we're doing, right? Mm-hmm. And yes. so, I mean, I'm not yes. surprised by it, but it's disappointing. Okay, but uh, now some of this would not make Kent Sorensen out to be any evil genius. 
uh, some of these things that he's doing that you've reported properly so uh, would make it look like he's um, um, not nearly as bright as, as maybe some people might have suspected. What What's your answer to that? Let, let me. I think people need to realize kind of what the what happens in a campaign. So you know, in baseball, you know, we have we have the I Cubs, and that's Triple A, and they you know once in a while you get a player who gets called up to the big leagues to play, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The same's not true in, in politics. In po- I mean, in politics, it's like the Chicago Cubs and, and the rest of the Major League Baseball teams decided to come to Des Moines and, and play a series. Mm-hmm. The big leagues comes to us. Right. And so the our actions, uh, the things that we're used to getting, uh, that doing, and maybe, you know, we can round a corner here mm-hmm, or, or mm-hmm. you know, uh, maybe act maybe inappropriately here and there and get away with it. Right. The national state, you're on the national stage. And I don't think sometimes Iowans realize it, that they're all, everyone's watching you. You mess up. It's big and it's big news. And I think that Sorensen got caught up in the fact that he was still playing in his, in, in, in the small in sandbox, the small and, sandbox mm-hmm. and, and he, he didn't realize that the big leagues came down. Okay. And uh, I think that's what kind of scooped him up. No, but okay. Go to my question, though. Is, no, he's just a greedy politician. All right. You don't, no, no. You could no, you could have him answer, but I I don't think Ken Sorensen. And I've met Ken Sorensen, and I like Ken Sorensen. Ken Sorensen always treated me fair. Mm-hmm. Now I don't get involved in politics. I think I've had him on the air once before. He's friends with a good friend of mine, so I kind of want to stay back from it as much as I can. But to to Max point. In, po- in politics, especially presidential politics, this is true with any activist who wants to go be employed with one of these campaigns. This is the time where you can you can cash the check. This is the time where, you know, I remember uh, making my decision on, I really like Steve Forbes, but I, you know, back in 2000, and one of the decisions was, is, well, I at least know Steve Forbes will have the money to pay me, mm-hmm. you know? I mean... Well, but your but position's I mean, a little different now. Well, Craig. it is different now, but I remember thinking, though, I mean... You got to remember, presidential politics means there's an influx of money into the state, and everyone, I don't care who you are, is is trying to. I mean, look, I'm trying to sell ads to them all uh, when it's when it's caucus time. But I We're all I, trying to. I don't think you're 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 his situation are not analogous. I I mean, he knew going in that this was a violation of Senate ethics, and you were not an elected f- uh, official when you were trying well, to. Find no, you're you're absolutely right. And I actually contend that Ken Sorensen would have been far better off just openly challenging the Senate ethics rule and and having the campaigns pay him directly than doing what he did. But did he really, I mean, who, gosh, this is a naive question. Who out there really thought Ken Sorensen could turn it for Ron Paul in the last final <laughs> hours of the campaign? You ha- you Okay, again, you got to put this all into perspective because you got to remember the dynamics that were going on. So at the time of the switch, the jump, polls, the polls showed that Rick Santorum was gaining. But, but at the top, it was Ron Paul or Mitt Romney. Uh, Romney up two uh, or, or Paul up one, right? So it was very close. So I think they saw the Santorum momentum and the, the, they're saying, look, we got to do something where we could, we could kind of stunt his growth, grab two or three percent, and win the Iowa caucuses. Thus, what can you do? Well, they all believe, like, do I think uh, Kent Sorensen was overhyped into what he could deliver? Yes. I think everyone who works on a presidential campaign in Iowa, sorry, you're overhyped. Um, but I think they viewed mm-hmm. that, look, he did have, he could have sway with social conservatives and Second Amendment conservatives. Might have made it look like there was a big mass exodus towards Ron and, Paul, which is what they were trying to accomplish. And they just saw, they just witnessed, you mentioned it, Vander Plaats's endorsement of Santorum. And then there's some growth in his camp. And so, look, I think that they were at the, campaigns get desperate at the end. And for Ron Paul, they needed an Iowa win or, or they weren't going anywhere. Uh, Craig Robinson is our guest. When we come back, how does this impact the Iowa caucuses? Just a personal qu- a conversation between Tom and I for just a second. Hey, Tom, mm-hmm. you know, you and I know a lot of people, and we're Iowans. I'm thinking we ought to get in the consulting business in 14 and 16. You take Paul, I'll take Santorum, and w- w- what, 15 grand a piece a month? We, we, we both strongly backed Mitt Romney in his first run back in 08, Mac, and I, don't, I think we sold ourselves out way too cheap. 
Yeah, all I, we got was a house party out of that. Yeah, we didn't get anything. <laughs> we didn't get anything. I mean, when this whole Ken Sorensen thing came up, and I heard about, I didn't believe it up front. Right. I didn't believe this kind of money per month for this pack and this wife from this jewel. I thought this is a flipping movie, and it's happening under my nose in my town. Hey, with Chris, my candidate, Chris, Chris. This was all ra- uh, uh, earned legitimately, earned in air quotes. Christopher Rance was paid seventy six thousand dollars for two months of consulting for Thaddeus McCotter. Think about that. Huda huda huda. Exactly. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, um, we're going to find out if there's any uh, uh, danger here for the Iowa caucuses. Also, for those of you on webcast one live dot com. One of my favorite teachers, teachers, and pastors is on next, only on webcast1live.com. Matt Chandler from the Village Church in Texas will be on with us, basically talking about how do you love someone through the sin of their lifestyle. That's next. Yes, now your favorite programs on Webcast One Live can all be watched and listened to on any Android or Apple device. Your phone, tablet, or iPad. Yes, your favorite shows on Webcast One Live are available live or on podcast wherever you go. Let me introduce to you some of our great shows. I'm Michael Libby. I'm the host of Insight on Business, the News Hour. We're seen live at 8.45 each Monday morning at Webcast One Live or whenever you want on my blog or on the internet. So what qualifies me to talk about advertising, marketing, and consumer trends? Well, it's my business. Inside Advertising, Marketing, and Communications has helped dozens of companies, small, medium, and large, learn how to use advertising correctly. And we pass that information on to you each and every week. Hi, I'm Doc. You listen to me every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. on Doc and Lefty Radio Podcast Program where we discuss all the relevant topics of the day, including state, local, and national politics. My partner in crime, Lefty, often likes to have a little bit of conservative justice served upon him. So please turn in for the fireworks every week from 6 to 7 p.m. on Tuesdays at webcast1live.com. Thank you. So when you want to watch your favorite Webcast One program, remember, there's an app for that. You know, there's an app for that. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. We've got questions. You've got the answer. Join the conversation. It's your voice we want to hear. So call 855-244-0077. Now, here's J. Michael McCoy. 10 before the top Salem Radio Network news. And then at five minutes after four o'clock only here on Webcast One Live, we are going to be, uh, boy, how technology has changed us. We're going to be recording an audio program for our national XM Cirrus and American Family Radio Network show called Restoring Hope. But because of the way we do things around here, we open the back door and let the mice come in and watch. And the mice are you. And you'll be able to listen and watch this interview live at webcast1live.com. So you'll not only be able to hear it later in its produced form, but you'll be able to hear it today in its raw form. And uh, we're going to be talking about a a subject that I think is really important within the Christian world. A lot of people are afraid to talk about it. Uh, Matt Chandler, a couple years ago, did a very good men's Bible study on this. And the question is this, loving someone through their sinful lifestyle. And I know we think of gay first, but how about adultery? How about alcoholism? How about when we, when we watch someone who's just greedy? Who's just greedy, 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 greedy. And then the collection plate gets passed around and they drop in a five when you know that they could drop in a million times that. So how do we love someone as Christians through when we are, it is apparent of those sinful lifestyles? That's what we'll talk about today on that special show. It'll start at five minutes after four. 
Craig Robinson is here along with Tom Coates. Okay, now I'm going to ask a funny question. Mm -hmm. I want to know who, and I don't need names, but identify them, would think this would hurt the Iowa caucuses? Because I don't think it'll hurt them. Do you think it'll hurt them? Um, Look, I... We've already been dealing with all this stuff, so I don't think it's really... I think 2016, Iowa's First in the Nation caucuses cemented it's going to happen. I think what we always have to be worried about is perception for the future. And I think that... um, um, and look, Democrats like to, you know, point at us. And I mean, look, Tyler Olson, who's running for governor against Branstad, saying you need to ask this guy to resign and all this, you know, they're playing politics. Sure. Um, the nas- Some of the national media are going to say, look, this is bad for Iowa. It ain't good. It's not good for us. But, it, but, but it's, it's business support. Right. Well, and so, I mean, I listened to this Rachel Maddow thing one, one of these nights. And she's talking about how bad it is and it's corrupt and it's, you know, no one, no one cares about, you know, a state senator in Kansas, his endorsement. So they never pay for it. But I'm like, okay, so you move it to Kansas, then that state senator matters and there's going to be the same stuff. So look, I, I don't think it matters as long as we police it. When we find good actors, we or bad actors. We go out there and say, uh, 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 this hurts us. We're not going to let. We're not going to stand for this. Well, so I, so, yeah. I think as long as we we continue to root out any bad th- stuff that goes on, we'll be fine. Yeah, well, Bradshaw. Yesterday on the new show that Bradshaw and I are doing, uh, Tom's favorite show to listen yeah. to, by the way. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> he said that he thinks we ought to go to a rotating first caucus in the nation, and I said it'll be two hundred years before one state gets the caucus. I said that's just a circus. Yeah. Actually, the proposal that I've seen that I liked, um, that I actually think originated in Iowa, was a plan where you um, you keep the four early states early: uh, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada. Look, the, it's important to start slow because it demands that these politicians actually do retail pol- uh, cam- uh, campaigning. Uh, and then, but what it would do, it was it would rotate regions regionally of what goes next, uh, because that's usually where it's decided. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't think it really hurts in the end of the day. I think it's more important for us to do what's right uh, and not do what, you know, uh, not worry about, you know, how this is going to affect it. Because at the end of the day, I'm not sure it will. Craig, um there was something that popped up the other day, and it's unrelated to anything we've just talked about. But this issue of Barack Obama stepping up once again and unilaterally, uh, dictatorially, illegally uh, amending uh, a, prem- a premise of Obamacare. Um, how can a sitting president come in and because his uh, corporate cronyism wants an exemption for a while from Obamacare, you give the big corporations up because you don't give the small ones. Then the Senate Democrats come in from the House and Senate and say, hey, we, we don't want that to impact. We could lose some staffers and so forth. Uh, we're going to need an Okay, well, we'll just take you clear out of there. Uh, those kind of unilateral changes, why doesn't someone sue and, and try to require the law to be held up to this, you know, to this administration. Well, I would, frankly, a number of congressmen did sue, not over this issue, not over this one, but over DOMA, Defense of Marriage Act, and and basically their argument was, uh, who's defending our laws if the Attorney General same, of this country? Issue, it's though. the same. It's the same issue, mm-hmm. and I think that it's really a serious question that I think needs to be put forth in front of the Supreme Court because. Uh, this is a dictatorship really under is. those uh, under those situations, and and, and, and he has. And by the way, it's gonna know. it's gonna squeeze small businesses and those people who you know, if you're 50 employees or less. Yes. Yeah, that all changes when it when all the economics of this doesn't work because we've been exempting this one and exempting this one. That means okay, small businesses, you've got to participate now because it's the only way it can be. Funded. Well, you decided a while back to quit enforcing our immigration laws. We've got catch and release. Uh, we had a cache of arms that would have would have felled an army. Uh, assault rifles, grenade launchers the other day. I sent you a copy of yeah. it, Mac. I sent you a copy, mm-hmm. too. In New York. Uh, it was on the border. And, and the the idea that this guy is, is he doesn't even have to go to the legislature anymore. He's going to rule through executive order, and that's that's the mark of a dictator, Craig. When are we going to hold him responsible? But it's, it's also the problem when, and I think Republicans are now doing a better job of, of saying no and fighting back. But I think for years and years and years, we've all treated the president of the United States 
whatever party they are is that hey they get to do kind of what they want to do but you know now now we're finally s- s- saying look you're stepping out of bounds here buddy okay really important question you're one of the only guys i think i trust to answer this you just said that all the presidents do this was bush did he do stuff like this um i don't think to an extent um, but I do think that, I mean, one of the criticisms of Bush or, or the descriptions of him that I thought was very accurate was that, you know, we always seem to elect governors a lot of times to be president of the United mm-hmm. States. And then they believe that they're the governor of the country. And so they don't, in that sense, they don't really respect um, uh, the Constitution where states have rights and states, you know, can do their own things. And so, I mean, I do think that there's there's probably some example, but nothing to this level. So then we elected nothing a rookie level. senator with no pedigree for this position at all, <laughs> and he does act like a dictator. I, I think he's taken any kind of... I mean, you're talking about but Richard it, Nixon? Richard Nixon wouldn't have dreamed to take this kind of here's, liberty. Here's here's the deal. Barack Obama has done nothing uh, that we didn't think he would do. He is exactly who we thought he was when he ran the first Only time. Only more so. But it's worse. He's actually doing the stuff that we thought maybe he couldn't. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a lot worse to me. All right, Craig, thank you. God loves you. Thank Thanks. you for the hard work that you do. And your lovely family thank them for the time that you put into this tom thanks for being here uh coming up here in just a few minutes a live interview with uh pastor matt chandler from the village church in texas asking the question loving someone through their sinful lifestyle as christians how do we do it that's here live on webcast1live.com